started with the bulletin here. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully some more people walk in, but uh, we got a good class this morning on obedience. Uh, gone over it a few times and just wanted to get this, get the, really listen to what the Spirit was saying on it. But before we do that, I want to go over the bulletins. Uh, and in the bulletins, of course, our YouTube. Uh, right now, we are not live streaming. Uh, we're recording and then uploading. Uh, for now, Jasmine's down sick. Uh, she gave me the gist on how to edit. I still may need some of her help. And she said if uh, we live stream, she said there's a lot more to it. So <laughs> she's a little bit more tech savvy than some of the rest of us <laughs> but if you do have any problems viewing the YouTube Jasmine you can give her a call 419-481-7802 uh, uh, pray for her to get well soon um, outreach as I brought up uh, the last time I was standing here is outreach you know, we have one here that is canceled, but really, truthfully, outreach is never canceled. You can outreach to anybody every day, all day long. Anybody you come in contact with, outreach them and uh, get them to Jesus as quickly as possible if they do not belong to a body. You know, it's very important that they get to a body of Christ. So don't stop outreaching. Uh, when, when we have one here canceled, but... The part that we're not doing right now is uh, the knocking on doors uh, with the sickness and uh, that some have been having and uh, being really cold outside. Don't want anybody getting even more sick. You know, there's uh, other things besides the coronavirus they can get sick with. But, uh, you know, people that you talk to, don't don't stop reaching out to them. Don't don't. Put a halt on that spirit. You know, allow that spirit to come forth and reach reach out that hand and bring them to Jesus. Uh, hospitality, because Jasmine is down, we cancel hospitality so no one gets sick in the house and it gives us a chance to sterilize everything when she does get better, you know, so that nobody gets sick. Uh, well, but been doing that. praying praying this next Saturday when they have hospitality and just pray that she gets better. She don't have a fever, but she's been coughing. Her stomach's been bad. So uh, the symptoms aren't really co are COVID. But she, she thinks she may have strep. The same thing. That's what I thought she had. Really, it ended up being she had the flu. Right. So just, like I said, just continue prayers on that. Um, like I said this morning, it is on obedience. Uh, but before I start on obedience, I do want to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for those who gathered here this morning, Lord. And uh, just pray that uh, you continue bringing them to us, Lord, and that they seek you first in everything so that they can have your grace and mercy added up onto them, Lord. So that they can have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And and they can have many things that they've never had before because this world, it offers no guarantee, Lord. Uh, but just to be in compliance with, with you and, and your word. We love you in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So obedience. What What is obedience? Anybody tell me what obedience is? Any idea? Your, your thoughts on obedience? I hey, Anybody's. Obedience is when you hear something that you know to be true and you get up and do it. Yes. You get up and do it. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to give you two definitions. One, good morning, ladies. Sorry, I thought I'd my clock. No, you're good. We're, 
we're just getting started. We'll give you two definitions. Uh, you know, the first one, you know, the thing I asked was how you would describe it in your own words. Uh, and what it is, is the world describes obedience as compliance with an order or law. You know, pretty much do as you're told. You know, just as a, a young child would be taught to be obedient to their parents. Uh, you know, and it's no different than being obedient to God, the Father. Uh, the Bible definition of obedience is to hear God's word and to act accordingly. Uh, God's word, re it requires compliance. Uh, church, YouTubers, it requires compliance. You know, so don't just be a pew sitter. Don't just be a hearer of God's word, but he wants you to be a doer as well. And, you know, I'm going to remind you of that word believeth a few times throughout this lesson. And believeth means is not only believing in God's word and what God says, but to also live it, to do it. I'm going to start off this morning. I'm going to start off and act, or no, sorry, in James chapter 1, verse 22. Go to James chapter 1, 22. Uh, go there now. Uh, some of y'all got the Bible apps. Get there a little quicker. Give some of y'all with the Bibles a little bit more time. James, James chapter 1, verse 22. says here it says to be doers of the word and not just hearers only deceiving your own selves so Christianity it requires action you know as important as it is to listen we also have to be doers because in verse 21 it says uh, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls it says it, it, his word is able to save souls but if you're just going to be a listener and not a doer how can it save anybody <clears throat> you know uh, you have to have, have a little action behind that uh, because if you're only being a hearer then you're being disobedient to everything that God says you know, uh, like again, remember, belief is an action word. You have to, if you're going to believe and hear it, you also have to live it. Uh, in verse 23, it says, "For if any be a hearer of the word and not and not a doer." He's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. That's the part I went over with our pastor there. Uh, need to get a clear understanding of this. And what they're talking about, beholding your face in a mirror, is when you look in the mirror for only a moment, and then you go back to do exactly whatever you were doing. And you all pass by a mirror, and you take a quick glance, and then continue doing what you're doing. You know, and, and you forget ever looking in the mirror. Well, it's the same with God's Word. What it's saying is telling you, you know, don't be like that. You know, don't be looking at yourself in the mirror and then, and then forgetting whenever God brings His Word, do not go out and forget everything that God had revealed unto you. And the reason why you forget is because you're not a doer. 
you heard it and then you moved on with whatever you were living before. And you're not living that Jesus. And you go out in the world. And if you're not a doer to do what God asked of us, like I said, we forget. And, and whenever we forget and don't do, it doesn't do anybody around us any favors. It doesn't get them to Jesus. It only gets them to Jesus if you take it to them. That's why we share, you know, and it's not just for their benefit, but it's for yours as well. Because if you if you forget what you what the Lord just revealed to you, then you're not living that, you know. It's, so it's not just for their benefit, but it's also for yours. You know, it, it, it edifies and it teaches ourselves as well. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. It says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all uh, his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Well, it says to hearken diligently to listen to the Lord with care. That's what it's saying. When it says to hearken diligently, it means to listen to the Lord with care of what's being asked of you. In other words, to be obedient. And then it, it, what it's also saying is saying to take notice and to, and to do all that He commands. You know, uh, don't just be obedient sometimes. But he says to be obedient all the time. And he says to do it this day. Do all that. Do, he says there. He says. Uh, uh, which I command thee this day. And what makes today any different from any other day? Because today is the day of salvation. You we may not be here tomorrow. He says to be obedient and do all that I command this day. Because you may not have tomorrow. Um, and when, whenever he comes back, you're going to want to be believing, be living that Jesus and not anything else. Be living that Jesus and be obedient and be doers this day. And in doing so, he's going to fill your life with goodness. To be set on high. You know, in other words, God is going to take care of all your outward concerns. As long as you bring him first to every situation. You know, constantly having him first in your life above all things. And he'll take care of all your outward concerns. As long as you're being known and obedient. Child of God. John 14, 22 through 24. John chapter 14, verse 22 through 24. In John chapter 14, verse 22, it says, Judas saith unto him, uh, not Iscariot, uh, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us 
and not unto the world. And Jesus answered and said unto him, If man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me, uh, I'm sorry, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hears not mine, but the Father's which sent me. See, what Judas couldn't understand, he couldn't understand that manifestation being restricted to only the chosen few. You know, so he, he was confused. He was confused by verse 19, which says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. He says, But you will see me. The world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, and ye shall live also. So, he, what he was confused about is when Christ comes again, why not to the world? Well, the answer is there in 23. You know, uh, and, and what 23 is, is that manifestation is limited. It's limited because it can only manifest itself in love. <laughs> it can only manifest itself in love. You know, they got that spirit of self-denial there and, and submitting this thing to Jesus. Jesus and Him alone. And it talks about making our abode with Him. You know, so that manifestation is, is, is personal. And not only is it personal, but it leads to a relationship with God. And again, you know, here's God. He's Showing us again the importance of obedience and assembly. In 24, you know, he shows the negative side, you know, that disobedience. And, and he adds here as well, he adds, uh, he shows the, you know, the unity between the Son and the Father. Whenever he says that the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. And it's showing it being unified. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse fifty eight. Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 it says uh, what it says there it says therefore my beloved brethren it says to be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord be unmovable in the Lord's work to be unmovable in the, in the Lord's work. In other words, uh, don't let anyone tell you that it's okay to be disobedient. Well, you don't have to show up for God every Sunday or Wednesday or Saturday or whenever Christ manifests himself. Or you don't have to show God how much you trust him by giving back and tithing offering. You don't have to share with everyone you meet. Or you don't have to pray or meditate on God's word. Don't let him do that to you. But we need to stand firm, unmovable, and be obedient. And know that you are not standing alone. Don't let his word go out void. And what that what it means is not let it go out void. Don't let it be empty. You know, don't come, you haven't come this far. You know, get into the kingdom to quit quit on God now. Because God has never quit on you. And he never will. You 
And whenever, and whenever you think that he has, you know, whenever you're at your worst, that's when he does his best work. You have to be, have that continued obedience and, and to call upon him for help. Luke 6, 27, 28. Luke chapter 6, 27, 28. In Luke chapter 6, 27, 28, it says, But I say unto you which hear, I say unto you which hear, in other words, he's wanting you to listen up. This, what's coming next is important. He says, To love your enemies and do good to them which hate you. But, you know, like Christ said, you know, they don't hate you. What they hate is me. You know, they don't persecute you. They persecute me. But he wants you to love your enemies. And what best way to love your enemies than to bring them to Jesus? So that they can have that change of mind. And conform to this world no more. But to come to Jesus Christ. Don't make them. Don't, don't make them enemies. Love them just as Christ did. Because... Yeah, I mean, if, if they're of the world, God said, if you're of the world, you're an enemy of me. But you don't have to be. Here's my son, Jesus Christ. He, want, he wants that fellowship with you. He wants that reconciliation with you. You know, and it, 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 loving your enemies is a call of obedience. It's called of, of obedience of God's word. And and reason why he says to love your enemies, because love is the heart of the Savior's teaching. And the reason why it's the heart of the Savior's teaching is because it's the essence of the character of God. Love your enemies. And it's hard for some of us to do, it is. You share Jesus, they're either going to accept it or they're going to walk away. But we need to be that example of being a Christian. Well, what's a Christian? A Christian is one that is like Christ. Well, if Christ loved them, and if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you should be loving them too. Because you're supposed to set the example just as Christ did. You know, uh, and Christ was all about love. Like I said, it was the character of God. That's what, that was the heart of his teaching, his love. And, and when he says to love them, he's not just talking about speaking outwardly. I love you and then thinking, yeah, I'm walking away. No, it's not just speaking outwardly, but you need to be speaking inwardly as well. You know, because God knows your thoughts. And if your thoughts are anything different than what's coming out of your mouth, are you still being obedient? I mean, if you got that hate, hate in your thoughts, but then you're trying to speak of Jesus, you know, you're not being obedient. You're still being disobedient. Your thoughts have to match exactly what comes out. Be fully in Christ. You know, don't have that lukewarmness, you know, because God just spews that out. He does not like that lukewarmness. Uh, and, and if other Christians, if you ever hear other Christians that they should speak ill of you, bless them too. And, and not just bless them too, but when you bless them, get them back on track with what Jesus is saying. Get them back on track with what God wants. Romans chapter 12, 
verse 11 through 13. Romans chapter 12, verse 11 through 13. In Romans chapter 12, verse 11, it says, not slothful in business. Then it says, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tri tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, excuse me, given to hospitality. I was going to try some of that hospitality Saturday that we got from Wednesday class there. I was, but our vehicle that we took was pretty broken down. We were just hoping that we made it home. <laughs> and we were praying. We know God had it, but, we, you know, we had to get home. We were going to stop and see Tyler and Amber. And I haven't seen their new place yet. But, uh, you know, it's all, again, as we had learned, it's all part of that hospitality. How you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, what it's saying here in 11 through 13, uh, focusing on 11 there, is what it says. It says to have zeal and not to be sluggish in obedience. To have that zeal, not to be sluggish in obedience, because it's saying, no, you know, don't be, uh, no reference to the world, the affairs, but it wants you to be holy in spiritual matters. Okay, holy, holy in spiritual matters, and and don't be lazy in it either. You know, uh, twelve through thirteen talks about rejoice, patience, prayer, hospitality. You know, and these are Christian duties. But these Christian duties, Satan would use the doctrine of grace and the assurance of faith to settle down believers in spiritual slothfulness. Thinking they're doing everything they need to do and, and not putting any action behind any of it and, and becoming slothful. And that's just something else Satan will, will use because he'll have you believe that you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. But really, you're just comfortable and you're not moving forward with any action. And to remind everyone again to warn against this, that word believeth. You know, I mean, it means it's an action word. It's not just to believe, but to live. And not just to hear, but to do. Fervent in the Spirit, it says. Fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord. Fervent, used by Apollos in Acts 18.25. We've been going over Wednesday classes there. You know, uh, it, it was used by Apollos there in Acts. And what it means, it means burning. It means enthusiastic. It means being passionate. So if you reread that, being fervent in the Spirit, he wants you to be enthusiastic in the Spirit. He wants you to be passionate in the Spirit. Serving the Lord. Christ loved us in this way, and we're to... <laughs> Word of love with that very same spirit. So and, uh, the last uh, scripture I want to hit up this morning is when you're obedient to God, you're blessed. And I want us to go to Psalms 128, verse 1. Psalms 128, verse 1. No, my brother, good to see you. Corby. Good to see you. How you doing? Good. Uh, so, Psalms 128.1, that says, this will be my last scripture this morning. It says, uh, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, walk, and that walketh in his ways. Well, you know, and a lot of people see fear of the Lord and what they're thinking. They're, it's not talking about that trembling fear. 
That's not the fear it's talking about. But to fear God is to take reverence of Him. That's what it means to fear God is to take reverence of Him. You know, before that, before we can be blessed, we have that deep re respect or that relationship uh, with Him, which is only through His Son Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ and and walking in His ways and being being obedient in all things. And when I say being obedient in all things, I'm talking about prayer. I'm talking about assembly. I'm talking about Tithing, sharing, caring, loving, patient, kindness, all those things. You know, and there, there's no law against any of those things. You can do it abundantly. You know, you're not limited. Uh, some think that their life is cursed. Uh, you know, why is all this falling upon my head, Lord? But God is merciful. He's not only merciful, but he's all powerful. And there's so many times that we limit that power. We limit what God can do. Do not limit what God can do. I don't serve a limited God. I serve a God with limitless power. He can do anything. And I've seen it time and time again through prayers done right here. And prayers answered right here. You know, we've seen it. He is not limited. So stop limiting what he can do. But answer that call. And call upon him for help. You know, we just have to be obedient and abide in him. You know, we're all going to have trouble. He doesn't deny that. But the thing is, is God's going to get you over that mountain. He's going to get you through that valley. He's going to get you through all those troubled waters. He says, just call upon me, repent, have that change of mind. And he says, you know, to, to die unto me so that you can live. So that you can have that everlasting life. But he says, be obedient. And when you be obedient, he's saying, do not set idle. Don't set idle. That believe is an action word. You have to live it. Don't just be a hearer. Don't just, I, I, I appreciate all those watching on YouTube and I ask you to continue to watch, tell your friends, but don't just watch, be a doer, get to the body of Christ. Go out and share Christ. Do everything. That, if you believe in the word of God and everything that God has to say, then do it. Don't just hear. Okay, well, the Lord's telling me to do this. So let me go out and do it. Put action in your belief, action of the Spirit, so that it may move you from wherever you are to the arms of God. And that's what I want you to take away this morning. If you're going to hear, get out and do, so that you can get to the kingdom of God, because you're not going to get nowhere just being a listener. But you have to have some action. The Wednesday class that we're going over, that Acts, you know, that's that's a good class, a good class that everybody needs to get. And what it's talking about is talking about the actions of the Spirit. And if you've been watching, I really, you know, it's all on our YouTube. You can follow up on all the classes there, and it's really good teaching. Uh, prayers for y'all. Love y'all. Love our mother church down there in Arizona. Hope to watch y'all later today. And uh, we're gonna take a break. Get on service. We've got coffee. We've got Danish water. <laughs> God bless. Okay. Well, good morning, y'all. It's good to see you all. I'm very thankful that, that y'all made it. Uh, Brother Steve, I guess your prayers were answered. He said, boy, I just hope to keep coming in. And next thing we know, here come Mike. And next thing you know, uh, Corby's sister comes in. And then Corby, and I was like, yeah, she's like, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good, guys. I'm just happy to see you all. Uh, boy, just telling on myself, I had to watch eight big bucks walk across the face of the 
the face of the woods back there this morning. I was just about ready to throw my hands up and say, I'm going to the woods, but <laughs> here I am. No, guys, I just love you. Uh, boy, guys, any special prayer requests this week? Tammy Hunt? One for Tiffany and Ryan, their son had 105 fever, so just pray for his healing. And his name is Braxton. Show? Jasmine. Jasmine's under the weather, guys. Betty? I got a praise. My sister-in-law was on her deathbed, and the first thing I thought of was calling Butch, and he got on prayer, and today she's at talking like nothing didn't happen to her, and I was there. I know she is on her awesome. way out. Thank you, so thank you, Butch, and thank you, Lord. Yes, we thank the Lord. Wisdom. You know, it's kind of funny, right at that particular time, I was telling Betty, right at that particular time, Steve and I was having a pretty heartfelt conversation at the same time, and it couldn't help it. I had to go right to the Lord and, and pray and stuff. And, and boy, I know, Betty, how you feel. And, and boy, it is, when it starts hitting your family, it really becomes very personal. But the prayers, guys, I'm just telling you, when we ask or somebody comes and asks, you know what, don't say I'll pray for you. Just take the time and, and stop right there, right then, and, and go to the Lord and pray. And, boy, I appreciate you coming back, Betty, and letting us know that in all reality that, boy, she's seen the power of that prayer right away. You know, and that all of a sudden, you know, here it is, you know, she's she's talking where she was on her day. She was out. She was going yeah, out. they said that she was dying to get there if you wanted to see her. You know, and so, more well, power of prayer, once again, only wanting God's will to be done. There must be something more that needs to be said or done there, uh, whatever it is. You know, I just thank God for that opportunity. So, well, guys, God does answer our prayers. He really does. And that's why I say to you so many times, don't ask me to pray if you don't think God's going to do it. Because, you know, he does it. You know, always. Don? I, I just got to praise, too. We've been praying for my mom. Um, they got, I had an open deal for Brian. She's been every for a minute now. So, thank you, Jesus. She's where she needs to be. Very good. Very she good, Don. Thank to be you. A place. Very I got one more. Let's put Mary Davis on. She's supposed to go in for uh, shoulder surgery. So, let's ask the Lord for healing for her on her shoulder. Yeah. Anyone else? Going once. <laughs> I'm not a very good auctioneer. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> That's what it usually is for me. Uh, well, guys, just uh, excited about our message. Excited about our Wednesday night classes. It's been really right online. Uh, just can't help it. We, we need to have that uh, example and that experience with the, with the Holy Spirit. And boy, in the book of Acts, it really is. You know, everybody says it's the Acts or the church in action. But really, I don't believe it's the church in action at all. I believe it's the Holy Spirit in action. Because you see, every place that they went, and as they spoke, and as they uh, uh, talked, people heard, and they believed, and they cried out, what must I do to be saved? Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? You know, and boy, Peter, he responds so, so very straightforward and he says you gotta you gotta repent you gotta believe you gotta be baptized every one of you for the remission of sin so that the gift of God can move upon you and boy guys at that moment uh, it's kind of funny because the first day there was 3,000 people saved I'm looking forward to that day someday you know 3,000 people saved on the first day and then 5,000 men saved the next day, and it doesn't talk about the women and children. You know, so there's, there's real power in the acts of the Spirit. And when that Spirit's alive inside of you, it gets up and it acts like it's got love inside of it, being obedient, all the different things. And so, yeah, it's a very stern thing. There's a lot of things that God comes across. He speaks to us in our hearts and minds. And, and it's hard sometimes to understand, but you've got a body of believers that you can surely go to that's had the experience themselves. 
that all you got to do is get in their ear, and I'm sure that every one of them would lead you in a direction that God would will for your lives. So, boy, guys, I'm very, very excited about the book of Acts. Today, we're going to talk about his blood, and, and that's something that I really do appreciate. The example that got to be shared on a Wednesday night class was, you cannot say that you love this lost and dying world unless you first apply the blood of Christ to it. Because it's in the blood of Christ that the sins were removed or cleansed. And so if you just go to a person and you don't spread the love of Christ over it first, there's no way you'll have the compassion of God to be able to share with them what God really feels for them. So very excited about our class this evening or this morning. Uh, be coming out of the book of Romans chapter 3 verses 20 through 26. But not to get there yet. Um, uh, what do we have? Any birthdays? Anniversaries? All right. Do we have some music? Please all stand and we'll sing when we all get to heaven. Very good.
good different specials this week or last week, the week before. I guess if you mess up on the specials, it makes the message a whole lot better. <laughs> because of his great love for us since the very failure in the very beginning of humanity you know what he's been trying to get every one of us gathered back to him as it was before that time and he's devised such a wonderful great way to be able to draw us back that so many of us miss it because it's so simple and the reason it's so simple is because he's done it all 
He's already did it for us. You know, it's not like you have to work at it. It's not like any of those things. He does require us to, you know, it's our, our responsibility to keep it going. But in all reality, once God has came and touched your hearts and your minds and opened up that heart to be able to be pliable in the love of God, listen, there's something that's real there that was never there before. And what that really is, is the forgiveness of sin. And really, if we could kind of, I, I, over the years, people hear sin all the time, church. But I really wish that we could come to the grips of what sin God's talking about. Sin misses God. And anything that makes you miss God is what he's worked so diligently in and punished his son so much with so that you and I could not be separated from him any longer. That's the sin that he's talking about. It's not the moral sins of the law. The law was written so that every man's mouth would be stopped and all would become guilty before God. And so therefore, that's what the law was written for. And you might get all, you might get seven, eight, maybe nine of them. But if you lack one, you lack them all. And so he's gave us only but one way out, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And guys, he gathered all that that missed God. Every excuse, everything that we possibly could have offered to God or even to our neighbors or even to our friends, he gathered all that right there in that vessel, Jesus Christ, and he punished him for the, for the due payment of you and I's missing God. And that isn't just here, that's for here, that's for the, the, the past, that's for the here, and that's for the future to come. But we have to come to that grips. You can't say you love somebody if you're going to harbor sin over them when God has removed it out of his sight. And that means if I miss your mark, well, I apologize. But I miss God's mark, which is far more greater than any human uh, missing. And yet God found a love so great for me and for you that he removed it so that we didn't have to be separated from him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's some of the best news I've ever heard in my life. It's the greatest news I've ever heard. And I just wish so many times that I would have heard that many years sooner. But I think what it was is nobody took the time to tell me that the sin that God's talking about is not the sin of the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the sin that causes us to miss Him. And the only way you can get past that is by the blood of Christ. And He's going to give us this example out of the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 20. I'm going to get there myself. Book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. If you have your scripture, I'd sure like for you to read along with me. Not only so that you hear it from me, but you got God's word right there in front of you. You know it's him who's speaking to you. So if you have your scripture, Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 20. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, 
And I probably have read that scripture several hundred times. But the thought of what God's telling us and what he's really showing us, church, is week after week, God gives us his words to feed that spirit that he's gave to you. And to feed it so that there's no love for God except through that faith in Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to say, I love God and God loves me. Because God can't love you and God can't have any connection with you if it isn't through Jesus Christ. And we have to understand that that was our opening door and that's what gave us the avenue to be able to get back to heaven. That was the avenue that let us get back to being able to have oneness with God face to face as it was before the fall of man. He gave us all kinds of different experiences. At the death of Jesus, when he gave up his soul and, and, and said it to Teletos, it is finished. Immediately that curtain that used to separate us from God, that holy of holies was ripped from top to bottom, showing that there was no barriers any longer that separated man from heaven an ability to go to a holy God. I don't know, but to me, that's some of the greatest news also. But here he is. He feeds us every week. <laughs> but there's no love for God except through faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know why it's so hard for us as viewers or us as a church body to realize that, boy, you cannot get there without Jesus Christ. <laughs> and now that here comes the the, the hard part. We need to know where Jesus is. He's not out in the world just wandering around. He's in his church bodies. He's in his assembled body. And it's where he is every week. It's where he is every time two or three are gathered together in his, in his essence, in his love. And for us not to want to gather together, church, it's like saying, I don't want to have a relationship with God because I don't want to have to go through church. I don't want to have to go through the body of Christ. I don't want to have to go through Jesus to get to God. Yet God says there's no way to get there any other way than through Jesus. I don't know, for me, I can't beat feet fast enough to the church in spite of whatever the world's saying, in spite of what this thing says. You know, it's in our teaching of God's righteousness. It's not just something that happened in the past. It's something right now. And now the power of God's word works into our salvation. In our salvation, the word salvation means deliverance. If you're not delivered the love of God week after week, day after day, guys, it fades away. And that's the way it is. It does away with the newness. It really does. And you guys really, I, I really don't think that anyone understands how much God lets me hear even though I don't hear. <laughs> I hear it all. And it's through that power of His working in our salvation or our deliverance that also accompanies the, the believer. And it's a constantly fresh and it's constantly relevant. It's not like it's just stagnant. It's constantly fresh. If you'll come and get some, y'all like fresh bread? Nothing like a fresh loaf of bread. But you know, after it's left open for a few days and it isn't it, you preserved very well, then it gets kind of, you know, hard and, you know, I really don't care for it anymore. It's the same way in the Spirit of God. If it's coming and it's relevant to you and it's a necessity to make sure you seal it back up and hold it and then share it with those that are around, it stays fresh and constant all the time. And it's relevant to not only your life but to the lives of those around us. He's gave that to us. This righteousness of God can only come through faith in Jesus Christ. You all want to be right about something? All you got to do is believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's the only time that I've ever been right in my life. And even I got that wrong because I ran away from it for 33 years. But in all reality, there was a day that God so gave me ears to hear. 
And all of a sudden, through that message of that preacher, right there in that church, I don't know, I like churches. But right there in that church, God finally gave me an ear to hear. And all of a sudden, that love of God entered into that ear. And it went past anything that ever got right here ever in my life. And it literally passed the mindset and went straight into the heart and opened that heart to where I could really see what God was saying to me. And what he really said to me is, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. And it doesn't matter what you're going to do in the future. I gathered it all and I put it right there in my son and I punished him for every bit of it so that I don't remember it any longer. For the first time in my life, I come to the realization that God really loved me. And you know, he loved me in such a fashion that he continued to feed that, guys, until it could come to somebody else, like you. And all of a sudden, that reality of God opening up the ear and all of a sudden letting you hear so where you see Jesus Christ and you followed him in a scriptural baptism. All of a sudden you rose a brand new creation to God, not to this world. You are the same old person. But when you rose up out of that water, that spirit of God for the first time in your lives was able to enter into that heart. That heart was hard and calloused against God before that because every man is at enmity with God without Jesus Christ. And there ain't no playing games about it. There ain't no, you know, guys, listen, I played games too. But when it comes to the reality that God speaks to your heart, today is the day of salvation. Not next week. Not when I get around to it. It's the day that he opens up that heart. It kind of gives us a better rendering of the phrase faith in Jesus. It really does. All of a sudden, it gives us a real setting of, boy, what it means to have faith in Jesus. Not what I see, but what I believe. I believe God gathered all of it. I believe that he's seen everything that I failed miserably at. I believe that he gathered it right there in that vessel, Jesus Christ. And I believe he punished him so bad that the earth shook and the, and the sky darkened and, and everybody was trembling with great fear. Jesus is that very object of our faith, church. He's everything to us. He's wonderful. If you want a little wonderfulness in your life, get a little Jesus in. He's everlasting. So if you got Jesus there, and by that blood of Jesus, guys, if you don't think you can get through to the next day, remember he's everlasting. He doesn't go away. Just because you go away in your mind or in your heart or in your actions, it's not like that. Jesus never goes away. Verse 24 said that, you know, being justified freely. You know, here we are, we're being justified freely. It didn't cost you a thing. It means that to, to be declared by God not guilty through Jesus Christ. By God, guys. The guy who created it all. The guy that knows it all. The guy that had purpose and didn't like the, the earth being without form. Didn't like it to be void. See, he declared that by himself, not guilty through Jesus Christ. There ain't no man, woman, or child that's going to be held guilty before God that believes in Jesus Christ. That's pretty powerful. In the same token, we have to be obedient, Brother Steve. We have to be obedient to God's word. And it's by that grace of God which is freely a gift, that unmerited, in other words, guys, you ain't gonna never get good enough for it, that unconditional, there's nothing you're gonna be able to pin on the wall to say, this is how I got there, It's not conditioned at all, it's just the love God had for you. Now, <laughs> we live in a crazy and a perverse generation, we really do. 
but it's probably no crazier or no perverse than it was back in Jesus' time. It missed God all over the place. And God's grace came along, that unmerited, unconditional favor, and he freely gave a gift to you and I. That same gift that Jesus Christ himself had, that spirit of God in the flesh, he freely gives that to you and I. It's through that redemption, meaning that it was paid in full. We've got to see Jesus, guys. We've got to make him real in our minds and in our hearts. We've got to make him as real as the people sitting around you. He has that real. And it's through that redemption, that buying you back, paying in full, that Jesus bought you. And he paid the full price for you. Verse 25 said, whom God set forth as a mercy seat or a substitute for us. The word they use there is propitiation. That's what it means. It means to pass over what you've done. Or it means to stand up in, in place of you. In our Lord's death, it brings many truths to God's love for you and I. Through that death right there on that cross, it brings, it shows the very illustration of God's love for you. It was a sacrifice, an offering of his blood and his life for you. Amen. If that's not an act of God's love, then I don't know what is. If that's not enough to make you know that this holy God that's been separated from your lives for so many years, I don't know what will turn the switch on. Because he sacrificed. And by that offering of his blood and his life is how much God loved you. He gave his only begotten son. It seems a bit vicarious. In other words, it seems a little bit on the, on the strange side. Why would he die? You can't hardly find a man that will die in this world for another man. But he died not for his own sake. Another illustration of God's love. He didn't die for his own sake. He could have lived forever right here on the face of this earth. Forever and ever and ever. But he died not for his own sake, but for the sake of others. You and me and everybody else. Not just a few. You know? They say, you know, God says a few will make it into the kingdom of God. But we've got to remember that a few to God is like the grains of the, uh, grains of the sand in the seashores, <laughs> plurally. And I don't know, I've spent some time on the seashores. And I know if you grab up a handful of sand, you sit down and count every grain of that. And he said the numbers, them few numbers that God speaks about, it's the numbers of the grains of the seashores. Or the numbers of the stars in the universe. Try counting them ones. And if you think you got it, then go to Alaska and try it again. See, that, that death of Jesus was substitutionary also. Christ suffered the death as a penalty for our sins. Once again, illustrating what God had great love for us. My goodness, in the fall of the evening, every fall of the evening, God come calling and he'd call out, Adam. And they would sit down and they'd have fellowship one with another every evening in the cool of the evening. Christ's death for the sinner satisfied God's righteousness, God's nature, God's moral order, whereby removing his wrath against those who missed him. I'm not quite using the word sinner because we don't understand it. We don't even know what it means anymore. But I want you to know, 
God done all these things and he removed every wrath that he had against you because of the blood of Christ. God was in Christ right there all the time looking over this world reconciling the world or mankind back unto himself once again showing God's great love for humanity he was right there I can't help it in my mind to keep coming up with the thought of here's God and in Jesus and he comes to his own town and he stands up over Jerusalem and he looks down over Jerusalem and he and he's cried his love for them cried his love for them and I see it even in my own witness as God cries out his love for humanity and all he says is my God my God how many times would I've you know gathered you up like a hen gathers her chicks but you would receive me not Some of you know what it's like. Or you got chickens. You know what it's like. And that mother has chicks. I'll tell you what, if she thinks there's a threat, she gathers up, she fluffs up, she hides it. You can't even see that chicken. That chick, I should say. You can't see him. And Jesus cries over and God in him. And he looks down upon humanity even today. And he, I'm certain in heaven he stands up there and he cries. Oh my God, my God, lost nation, lost world. How many times would have I gathered you if you'd have just heard? How many times would have I gathered you like a hen gathers her to cover you up and nobody could see your faults or failures? How many times would have I done that? How many times have I done that? But yet you still don't believe. God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself or mankind. And the proof of God's word tells us right here, and I'm just going to read these scriptures to you so that you know. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, that is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Sounds like God's loving somebody. Or John 3, 16, that we all know so well. That God so loved the world. And I'm not he's talking about the world like we see this round ball. He's talking about all of humanity. God so loved humanity that he did something about it. He gave the only thing that he had he gave his only begotten son. Amen. For whoever would believe upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we all read that pretty good, and we see it and everything else, and we hear it all over the world. But we miss the rest of the story. We miss the other side of it, where he says that he didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, because the world was already condemned. He didn't send Jesus into the world to say you're bad or you're not. He sent him in because the world was already condemned. Romans 5 8. He says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still yet missing him, it says sinners, just so you know. But while we were still yet missing him, Christ died for us. Go a little further back in chapter 8 of Romans. Verse 8, or verse 3. Romans 8, 3. It says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now let's go to verse 32. Verse 32. 
same chapter. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, I don't know, but this sounds like a God that loves you. It sounds like he gathered it all. It sounds like he put it out of his sight. Got to go a little further for you, though. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we, for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things, and through whom we live. Ephesians chapter 8, uh, chapter 4, I'm sorry, starting in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I think he was Southern. <laughs> you know? He was in you all. Can you imagine that? A sacrifice to atone or to make a rep. Uh, a rep uh, Yeah, can't, can't think of the word. Uh, a covering for sin, I'll just go there. <laughs> it's by Christ's death, the guilt and the power of sin that separates God and the believer was annulled. It was done away with. Guys, that's, that's the just of the best news from God to man. Is that that thing that separated us, that 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 lie from Satan? Did God surely say you would die, or is it that you would know both good and evil? That's a trickery thing. Does God say you really have to go to church to be saved? Does God say you really have to be baptized to be? Deliver. Does God really say that he will specifically put you where he wills? <laughs> All I know is what it says there in 6 and 7 of Ephesians is, you know, it was infectious. It means that it wasn't just for one. You talk about the coronavirus being infectious. The love of God should be so effectuous that it should get over the whole world. And I thank God that he's given us instruments such as a camera to be able to touch multitudes of people where we couldn't do it before. And it's infectious one way or the other. It'll either affect you in the fashion of seeing God's love for you or it'll affect you in the other side and run you off to, to, to be in, uh, affected with the, the infection of the world, lostness. It's effectuous, church, but it's also victorious. Yes, believing in God, believing that Jesus really did pay that price for your sins that separated you. It's, it gives you that victorious knowledge right there on the cross. Christ fought against everything that separated you and I from, from God. And he was triumphant in what he did right there on the cross. That power of sin, that power of Satan, that demonic host that held people captive, or no more. His death was the very initial victory over the spiritual enemies of both God and man. 
Because God didn't like you being separated from him. Pretty obvious to me. He knows everything, but yet he still come calling in the cool of the evening. Adam, Adam, where art thou? Was it something God wanted? And by that ransom of his own life, Jesus I'm speaking, he liberated us from being enemies that not just you and I, but the whole human race. And that whole human race is in bondage, believing something other than the truth. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Guys, I don't know what might come up in your life this week that may cause you to separate from the love of God. I don't have any idea. But according to what he says, is, you know, he took and healed all who were oppressed by the devil. The only ones that are going to miss God are the ones that are being held captive by the devil. They're the ones that are going to suffer. But here he says that he's done something. For God was with him. We're a part of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. God's with you. God's with you. Don't let nothing separate you from that fellowship. He made us free. But free to do what? Free to serve God. Next time your husband or wife upsets you, you're free to love them. <coughs> See what happens when you do. All the things that were brought up by God's word and spirit this week, church, is for all people. Not just you. But for all people. But only, for only the actual reality is it's the individuals who by faith accept Jesus Christ and his death for them that it'll have any effect. It's only them. If this has changed your mind, how God feels about you, every week we get to this point in our message. Every week it's as if I'm standing right next door to God. Every week I see him open up the windows of heaven, the balconies, looking down upon the face of the earth, and just looking for who might call upon Jesus to be saved. And every week I see him send out an invitation to you to come. Come for what reason? Be baptized, every one of you. For what? For the removal of what's keeping you separated from God. I don't care if you've been baptized 500 times. I'm telling you right now, until that baptism's real enough to know that God entered in, you ain't, you got wet. See, he wants you to be baptized, cleansed, so you don't have to miss God no more. See, in that name, and only in that name of Jesus Christ does he call anyone to be saved. So what must we do, church? You must confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's not something that you have a decision in. God says if you want to spend eternity with him, you've got to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because through confession, salvation or deliverance, I should say. And by faith and standing up and making that known publicly, that is your salvation. That's what's been delivered. I believe God told me to get up, be baptized so that I can have his spirit. I don't have to be separated from him any longer. See, all God wants is for you to know whether you're viewing or whether you're sitting right here, is that you can't blame him for you not having any fellowship with him. 
You can't blame me because he gathered it all right there in Jesus. What hinders you this moment, this day, from confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He's waiting for your response. He's looking to see who will come calling. He's just waiting. And it's like I can see it every week. And if there's any of you that have not confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he doesn't tell you maybe you can do this. He commands you to do it. Do we not realize, church, at the end of our lives and at the coming of Christ, every knee will bend and every head will bow and every mouth will confess that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, I don't know. God gives us this opportunity to do it now. Doesn't mean, you know, sit down and worry about it later. He says, as soon as you hear the message, I command you to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be saved, everyone. Follow him in a scriptural baptism, representing putting this thing to death and the me, my, and I, and how I feel and what I want to do and all those things. It's buried right there in that watery grave. And then you arose a brand new creation in Christ Jesus where for the first time in your entire lives, God can come rushing into that. God can't take residence in something that's going to continue to miss him. He can't do that. So he cleanses you of that. He buries you in that watery grave and he raises you back up. And before anything else, before you can even get out of the church, before you can even get out of the water, God comes in and rushes into that vessel. That's pretty sweet to me. And he seals you. And he guarantees you. With what? We know it as the Holy Spirit. We know it as the Holy Ghost. We know it as he's sealing you with his love. That's the invitation today. That's the invitation for the people of the world. That's the invitation will let you have a relationship with God forever and ever and ever. Let us stand together, please. Let's stand up, stand up for Jesus. That sounds like a good one. Stand up for Jesus. Guys, if you're out there and you need, need to come, you just come up here and we'll get to it. We'll ask God for the forgiveness of sins. We'll get you through the baptism of water. We'll do whatever it takes. If you've been baptized, it's all right, honey. If you've been baptized and there's still those things in your life that keep you from Jesus, get up here and let us get it before him so that we can get it out of there so that we can possibly have a relationship with God once again. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross.
you so much. I really do pray that you really did get to hear how God has loved you. And, and boy, right there at the cross and in that, in that blood of Christ Jesus, we've been made perfect, holy, and blameless before the sight of God. Hallelujah. I love you very much. Yes, Brother Steve, hallelujah. Hallelujah, one of the greatest forms of praise to God that you can possibly give. Hallelujah, church. Hallelujah, world. Let's go to Father. Father, once again, we just come to you and we just thank you for another gift of your love for us, Lord. And I just thank you for the words that you put in my mouth and in my heart and my soul this day, Lord, that boy, not only us here, but the world abroad can hear the, what great love you have and have the confidence of your word to be able to know that you really do say these things. Father, as we go forth this week, I do just ask that we spread that blood of Christ all over this lost and dying world, Lord, that, boy, we too might forgive them of their sins and that they might see the love that you have for them. Father, once again, looking forward to next week or even later this week, Lord, gathering us back together on Wednesday night. Father, you know, giving us that ability to hear even more of the acts of the Spirit. Father, I thank you in all things, and I thank you for the ones that you brought this day. Father, I'm just looking forward to living with you forever. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Amen.